If all you know about the medium is what you've gleaned from popular movie adaptations, then you can be forgiven for thinking that comics are the exclusive realm of the superhero. However, this couldn't be further from the truth. From the advent of the four-color funny, comics have encompassed all genres. From high adventure to lowbrow humor and every stop in between, the comic book has been the vehicle of choice for all manner of stories. One off-forgotten corner of the medium is the Western comic, of which countless thousands were produced. But these weren't just one-note tales of cowboys and Indians, but instead colorful stories of quirky characters and exotic situations ripe for exploration. Grab your canteen, your prospect and map, and your trusty horse. It's time for breakfast. <laughs> We begin with a story featuring Fightin' Bob Dale in a tale tellingly titled The Claim Jumpers. After panning on Gunbow Cliff for years, Jim Lansig has finally struck gold. The shock snaps the old codger's mind, and he wanders off into the desert, dying and becoming vulture jerky in short order. Not long afterwards, Shady Brick Maddock and his cohort find old Jim, still clutching the gold nugget. Backtracking, they discover the prospector's site and the recently turned treasure. Heading into town, they use some Old West chicanery to make the claim on the land. At the same time, Sheriff Bob Dale is chatting up Sally Lansing, her carriage loaded up with supplies. Seems she's headed up to Dad's shack on Gunbow Cliff as she hasn't heard from the old prospector in days. After seeing her off, the sheriff makes his way to the saloon, where he discovers Maddock crowing about the claim Jim Lansing just deeded him. Convinced something funny is going on, Sheriff Dale decides to keep an eye on the situation. Maddock, meanwhile, wastes no time in claiming the deed. He heads into the hills with a crew to extract the gold, while Sally is found and single-handedly buried her father. Just as she wipes the dirt from her dainties, Maddock and his gang ride in, but Sally ain't no shrinkin' violet, and she levels twin barrels at them. In spite of the wild claims that Maddock owns this land, Sally is set to pull the trigger as soon as one of these varmints blink, but she doesn't see this skunk sneak up behind her and snag her shotgun. Sheriff Dale, meanwhile, has been doing some digging of his own. After reviewing the claim, he decides to investigate further and rides on up to Gunbow Cliff himself. He comes upon a shocking sight, young Sally all trussed up by Maddock and his gang. Guns blazing, Sheriff Dale takes out two of the gang members, but Maddock and his crony get away. The sheriff frees a grateful Sally, explaining that not only was Maddock's claim on the deed bogus, but that there's gold in them Nar hills. Sally and the sheriff say their goodbyes, but one gets the sense that the story may have continued if there'd just been another page. Next up, it's Wilma West in The Range Runs Red. Seems some low-down cattle rustlers have been targeting the W.W., hiding off prize heifers in the night. Wilma and ranch hand Sonora Sam head off to investigate, ending up at a brook where the cows are being cut free. The pair make their way to the other side, Wilma taking a tumble into the water in the process. To her shock, Wilma's blouse comes out a shocking red. Seems the water is full of blood, as evidenced by this handkerchief dip. The pair head up river, unaware they are being followed. There they discover a horrific scene, the purloined bovines being butchered for their meat on the far shore. It's then the trap is sprung. Wilma and Sam are encircled by the gun-wielding rustlers. Wilma recognizes local louse, Barney Shane, who decides to keep the pair alive and toy with them a bit before killing them like the cows. The Old West was serious business. 
As our heroes are placed in a cave, Sam recognizes one of the gang as Cactus Charlie, a cowpoke he once knew. Just then, a guard sticks his filthy paw through the bars, groping at Sally. It's looking grim, but then the pair spy a fissure in the wall of the imprisoning cave. It's not big enough to escape through, but later that night, a mysterious accomplice passes the duo a six-gun and bullets. It could only be Cactus Charlie, and a plan is quickly hatched. The next time their handsy captor takes a swipe through the bars, Sam seizes his arm while Wilma pistol whips the pernicious pest. Retrieving the keys, our heroes slip the cave and make their escape, encountering Cactus Charlie and some handy horses. They flee the scene and we learn how Charlie had a change of heart after being framed for a murder he didn't commit. Heading into town, all is spilled to the sheriff, who dispatches his posse to round up the bad guys. And hey, it looks like it's going to be all okay. Next, it's one of my favorite old school icons, no less than legendary sideman, George Gabby Hayes. We've talked about Gabby here before. The archetypical old coot of the golden age Hollywood western, Gabby appeared in a hundred films, his omnipresence cementing his place in the pop culture strata. Let's check out a few of his comic appearances, starting with On the Warpath. Ooh boy. Things are looking rough on the Kitapu Indian Reservation. Some pine for the strange chief of legend who is foretold to lead the tribe to riches, but Circle Legs says bah. And who could blame him? Such a strange chief is impossible, at least until old Gabby pops up. A hairy man on a horse is the first sign of the chief, don't you know? Circle Legs isn't buying it at least until the Braves see the second sign in the form of the hairy horse that kneels. And while we know it's only Corker doing what Corker does, these fellows have never seen such equine agility before. Still, there's one sign yet to be signaled, and the tribe reaches for old Gabby, who attempts to draw his pistol for protection. Stuck in the holster, the third sign is revealed. The strange chief bears the weapon that does no harm, and now everyone believes the prophecy. Well, everyone except Gabby. That said, he's a good-natured fellow and decides to humor the tribe until he might slip away. The tribesman wastes no time in painting Gabby red, apparently you gotta be red, and switching his homespun duds for some fringe leathers. Gabby tries to explain he just wanted to ask the tribe permission to drive some cattle across their land, but his new subjects won't hear it. They even brandish their axes when Gabby decides to get out of Dodge. Here's the deal. The old codger can go, but only if he fulfills the prophecy and makes the tribe rich. As Gabby ain't exactly flush with ducats himself, well, that's going to be a tall order to fill. At the same time, two sharpsters named Benny and Denny approach, thinking Gabby is an actual chief. They attempt to trade him beads, a prospect the pragmatic Gabby refuses to entertain. See, all these fellers want to do is scour the banks of the Mud River for certain types of sediment. Thinking nothing of this foolishment, Gabby tells them to knock themselves out, as he has bigger problems. Making an escape as only he can, Gabby slips between the legs of his captor and on to freedom. It's short-lived, however, the whole tribe seemingly in hot pursuit. He makes a beeline for Benny and Denny, thinking they might aid him, but instead, the two pull their pistols and begin firing. Now getting it from both sides, Gabby flees into the hills. Snaking along on his belly, the cagey cowpoke doubles back, taking refuge in the mud farmer's hut. To Gabby's surprise, the hut is full of gold. There's also a helpful note explaining the origin of said gold. A loaded barge was lost in the silty river, and the valuable metal was deemed unrecoverable. However, the barge washed up here on Kitapu land, and the nefarious pair have been recovering it ever since. And speak of the devil, here are Benny and Denny now, and they're not happy to find Gabby in their hut. Snatching a gun from a nearby table, Gabby blasts the support beam, collapsing the shack onto their heads. And while Gabby isn't injured, he does get a big chunk of wood stuck in his mouth, preventing him from speaking. After inadvertently disabling one of his attackers, Gabby is captured by the Kitapoos, who tie him to a stake with the intention 
of burning him alive. Luckily, the smoke causes the conjurer to cough out the offending obstacle, freeing him to explain about the gold. Now rich beyond their wildest dreams, Gabby is allowed to go on his way by the Kidapoos. I hope he hung on to a bar or two of that stuff for himself. Next up, the best romances are cowboy romances. At least, that's what the Marvel bullpen of 1950 would have you believe. We begin with the winning of Barbara Kane, which we're told is a true life story. Barb is a hands-on kind of gal overseeing Pop's ranch after he's taken sick. Only Pop's thinks Barbara should be married up and letting a man run the ranch. Problem is, no man's tough enough to stand up to Barb, who says she's waiting for a man who can boss her around. Hey, don't blame me. I didn't write it. Barb has bigger problems. Foreman Red Mobley informs her the wheat crop is failing, and without it, the farm will go belly up. Red, a rough, hard galoot, thinks he's the answer to all of Barbara's problems. However, this little wildcat gives Red a taste of leather, leaving the man bitter and stinging. Barbara heads home, sending for an agriculture expert from Chicago. Yep, yeah, you could do that back in the day. You ordered them right out of the Sears and Roebuck catalog like everything else. A week later, Red comes bursting in, laughing his fool head off. Seems the expert is here, and his name is Oswald. And it's killing Red, but Barb isn't laughing. In fact, she takes Oswald on as an employee. The two head out to the range to check out the wheat situation, but it's clear that more is happening here than grain production assessment. Under the sway of Oswald Gary, Barb is no longer wanting to be boss, but to be bossed. Enigmatically, Oswald forgoes any PDA, but agrees to rehab her wheat field, so to speak. All is not peaches and cake, however. Seems the other hands take issue with Oswald, who's ditched the suit for this swinging little number. They quarrel over the new plan for circular irrigation, but Barb and her ever-present whip break up the proceedings. But Red has a dander up and makes a play for Barb. Oswald steps in, ready to give as good as he gets, and Red squares up to break his face. It's then Barb declares her love for the buckskin city slicker. Seeing the writing on the wall, Red flips the script. If Barb is in love with him, then golly, he must be all right. Oswald, however, balks at this. If any cowboy romance is going to happen, then by gum, he's the one who's going to initiate it, and Red needs to stick to his cattle. Cool as ice, Oswald departs, dropping a bit of cryptic advice in his wake. Shattered, Barbara orders the range prepared, as Oswald suggested, then heads into the hills for a moment of self-reflection. It's short-lived, however, as a bullwhip ensnares her waist and draws her into the powerful arms of the world's most charismatic agricultural engineer. He's proposing marriage, and it isn't a suggestion, but a demand. Oh, Oswald, you're such a man. After all that mushy stuff, I'm sure you're ready for another shot of Gabby, and this one is a walloper. Seems Gabby is hallucinating while the dreaded Black Raven bandit makes his escape. Using his ingenious balloon, the raven has robbed another ranch. With angry cowboys on his tail, he sets off into the blazing expanse of desert, leaving his pursuers choking in the dust. And the townsfolk are getting mighty fed up with these aeronautical antics, especially Gabby. As the sheriff is seemingly spinning his wheels, Gab takes matters into his own hands. Loading up his wagon with water, our hero lays in wait, but his barrels are emptied by a mysterious stranger. Soon enough, the raven strikes again, robbing the townsfolk at gunpoint. Gabby, intending to follow, seeks out the sheriff, but the lawman is off chasing down paperwork, and he's forced to draft Bodkins, the postmaster, to drive the wagon. The pair rush off in pursuit of the raven. Soon enough, the desert heat slows them, and they need a moment's rest, and it's then they discover that all of their water has been dumped, and they're chasing the raven on empty. Gabby sends the postmaster back to town, leaving the raven to believe his pursuers have given up. Gabby, however, continues to follow, the heat and thirst beating him down by degrees. At the same time, the sheriff's sleuthing has uncovered the raven's identity as Hugh Scurvy, and he rushes to the Scurvy homestead. 
Gabby has also arrived, although by now the old coot is hallucinating something fierce. He rushes for a mirage and runs plumb into a cactus. Hearing a yelp of pain, Scurvy heads outside to investigate, discovering both Gabby and the sheriff closing in. The villain ducks down in the grass, watching as Gabby mistakes the approaching sheriff for a dragon and opening fire before collapsing. Before he can react, the sheriff is confronted by Scurvy, who reckons, well, he's going to shoot them both now. Simultaneously, Gabby hallucinates a pool of Hattie's delicious lemonade with ice cubes and everything. He aims to dive in and knocks out Scurvy in the process. Why, it's the bravest thing the sheriff has ever seen. And all credit for capturing the bad guy goes to Gabby, who traded all for a glass of that lemonade. Let's catch up with Kay Barkate and her boyfriend, Deputy Dawn, as they head over to the dance. It's to raise money for the new school, don't you know? However, before they can head in, Dan is stopped. Turns out there's a holdup over at Cactus Corners, and the deputy has needed pronto. Unwilling to go home so early, Kate heads inside. She ends up sharing a dance with this spud, and get a load of this shindig. Just then, three rough-looking characters blow into town, and sure, they like to have fun, too. It's not long before one of these rogues has swept Kate up into a dance, and she pays him one for his trouble. The whole thing goes sideways when pistols are drawn. The dance has turned into a holdup. Oddly enough, no one else thought to bring guns, allowing the villains to escape out back with the loot. K-Bar gets a head of steam over this and heads off to find the sheriff following the thieves up Coyote Pass. Unfortunately, she's a better dancer than Sneak and is caught by the gang in short order. Pulled from her horse, Kate's fate looks dire indeed, but before we can dwell on it, we cut back to Deputy Dan. Finding his date has flown the coop with three skunks, Dan heads out to find her, discovering Kate's abandoned horse on the pass. He heads into the shadowed hills, fear of what might be falling her, foremost in his thoughts, and justifiably so, as these are some horny ranch arrows. That said, Kay is a smart cookie, and using her feminine wiles, manages to be free of her bonds. With a wince, she indulges this sex pest long enough to acquire a cigarette, a momentary distraction while she works towards her true goal. Turns out the hill she's resting on is made of flint, and one spark sends it up. Kay vanishes amidst the flaming conflagration, the kidnappers giving chase. Deputy Dawn, perpetually late to the party, sees Kate running around between the flames and shoots anything that's not lady-shaped, effectively ending the threat. The two share a passionate embrace, Kate's trauma merely an afterthought in the warming glow of the hillside inferno that she started with no way of putting out. Hot stuff. Following that, it's more cowboy romance. I mean, can you ever really get enough? Strung up Lance here should have known better, as Sherry will never be nothing but an outlaw sweetheart. Recovering from a shoulder wound, she shares her tale of woe with the Padre. Hostess of the Silver Queen Dance Hall, Sherry's always been criminal varmint Black Jack Lucas's gal. She confides that the irate townsfolk have sent the rangers after Jack and his men, and he's justifiably afeard, especially after gunman Lance Cabot steps off the stagecoach. Toady Paco is dispatched to learn all he can about Cabot's lady companion as Black Jack scurries off to hide. Paco returns with the dirt. The dish is named Cynthia Porley, and as soon as Cabot has caught Jack, he's retiring and marrying her. Jack tells Sherry she's to act as a sexy distraction, luring Cabot out to an ambush. She discovers him at the local saloon and makes her play, but Cabot is only interested in getting his man. This sets Sherry off, and she decides she'll win Cabot no matter what. She stalks him, taking the old got-a-match approach, and it's not Cabot isn't impressed, but, well, she's Black Jack's gal, and it's clear the outlaw is using her to get at him. Now Sherry is really riled. She shows up later at the ranger's door, lying about how Black Jack threw her over for Cynthia Porley and that the two of them have eloped. This riles Cabot, and common sense be damned, he rides off with Sherry to confront the pair. 
They come to a river they need to cross, commandeering a boat in the middle of a wild storm. In short order, the boat is capsized, and Cabot manages to save Sherry from the undertow. Dragging them to the shore, Cabot then finds a cave to hole up in for the night. I guess the guy he took hostage to steer the boat is dead, showing our supposed hero in a far worse light than the alleged villain Black Jack. At any rate, the pair attempts to make the best of it for the night, but it looks like they picked the wrong cave, as this one belongs to an angry puma. Bad kitty. Before it can attack Cabot, Cherry smashes its brain in with a large rock, which is brutal but impressive from a self-preservation standpoint. And while Cabot plays it cool, he can't but be impressed with his cavemate's moxie. The next morning, a snake moves in to take a bite out of Sherry, but in the end, it's Cabot who lands his lips on the curvaceous cutie. And that's it? Wait a second. What about Blackjack and Cynthia Porley? <laughs> Seems cowboy romances leave a lot of loose ends. Let's attempt to wrap them up with a final Gabby Hayes tale that could only be called Disaster in the Drawing Room. Seems Hester and Gabby have been invited to a big do at Miss Stiffneck's. This is a thing, as Stiffneck is the head of the exclusive Prairie Hen Social Club, and Hester has always wanted to be a member. Gabby, however, is more interested in his vittles than rubbing elbows, but it's no fun, no food for the old coot. However... If Gabby makes a good impression, why Hester will give him the best feed of his life. Unable to resist the prospect of a home-cooked meal, Gabby agrees. Before you know it, all dudded up and presentable-like. And hey, turns out old Stiffneck is familiar to Gabby. Did she by any chance ever dance at the Silver Dollar Saloon? Stiffy is understandably affronted, and Gabby figures he'd best do something charming to offset his faux pas, so he helps himself to a glass of punch. Disgusted by the taste of it, he looks around for a receptacle, spitting the offending liquid into a priceless Ming vase. Hester attempts to cover for her here-sweet honey, but he fumbles his teacup, spilling the steaming beverage all over Mr. Stiffneck. Gab attempts to turn the tide by offering a dance, which Mrs. Stiffneck is quick to regret. The cowpoke's clumsy feet stomp the hem of her fancy dress, shredding it like so much coleslaw. Mr. Stiffneck has had it and grabs Gabby with the intent of pasting him one, but the old conjurer is quicker and knocks his attacker out with a swift right to the jaw. The pair are ejected from the premises, with the takeaway Hester will not be invited to join the hens. This is a big bring-down for her, and she reprimands Gabby, using his real name. Upon hearing this, Miss Stiffneck blanches and excuses herself, and the pair head home, Hester hissing and popping all the way. Gabby, however, is having a think, and it comes to him not a moment too soon. Rushing to the attic, he unearths a sheaf of old love letters he'd once written, remarkably enough, to a young Mrs. Stiffneck. Seems they knew each other once, after all. Stiffneck is mortified. If word gets out she was once involved with this scrub, it will be curtains for her reputation. But Gabby has an idea that might solve both of their problems. Later, our hero heads home, fixing for the best feed of his life. When Hattie shoots him down, he offers up this, an invitation for her to join the hens. Overjoyed, she's true to her word, fixing Gabby a meal that he or we will never forget. So there you have it. Of course, there's so much more to Western comics than the few examples I've cited here, but I hope this motivates you to seek out books from the genre on your own. You never know what you might find. From all of us here down on the OG Ranch, we'll see you next week at breakfast.